Hello, Adrian here, and welcome to the Waking Cosmos podcast, where I have conversations with leading thinkers exploring the nature of consciousness, ethics, and life's place in the universe. Today I'm talking to Jamie Woodhouse, who is one of the world's leading advocates of sentientism, a philosophy and movement that aims to prioritize the well-being of all sentient life through the use of reason and evidence. Today we explore the origins, philosophy and history of sentientism, we discuss the intrinsic value and disvalue of states of consciousness as a potential basis for moral realism, we discuss human evolutionary biases that can cloud our ethical thinking, and the unique moral status of humans on this planet. We also explore the dangers of moral relativism, as well as how a sentiocentric approach to ethics could transform our world for the better. Other topics include how sentientism could shine light on future scenarios, such as the potential development of artificial sentient life, and how our descendants might eventually attempt to alleviate the Darwinian suffering of quadrillions of sentient beings living in the wild. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Jamie. Just before we begin, a quick reminder that the best way to support the continued existence of Waking Cosmos is by subscribing to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash wakingcosmos, where you can get early access to every episode. So that is patreon.com slash wakingcosmos. And to those of you who are already subscribed, thank you. You are the reason that Waking Cosmos exists. Okay, I now bring you my conversation with Jamie Woodhouse. Hi, Jamie. How are you doing? Hi, Adrian. I'm great. Thank you. How are you? I am good. Well, firstly, thank you very much for agreeing to this conversation. Today, we're primarily going to be talking about sentientism, which is a movement that you've been working very hard to popularize. So I think the right place to start would be perhaps you giving a general summary of the worldview or the philosophy of sentientism. Yeah, of course. It's a pleasure. I'd describe sentientism in a sentence as evidence, reason, and compassion for all sentient beings. So that's the one sentence version of it. In broader terms, I guess it's a worldview. It's a way of thinking about the universe and how we should live our lives. And people will be familiar with all sorts of other types of worldviews, you know, religious worldviews, maybe humanism. And sentientism is trying to answer similar questions. I think most of those worldviews are trying to answer the deepest philosophical questions and arguably the most important ones, the question of what's real, how should we understand the universe, what should we believe, and the questions just as importantly of ethics, what matters and who matters. So to get slightly more specific, when I say evidence, reason and compassion for all sentient beings, that's answering the what's real question with a suggestion that instead of using a sort of fideistic approach based on faith or a dogmatic approach where your views don't change with the evidence, that should we, we should adopt, a, at least in epistemological terms, a naturalistic approach that uses evidence and reason broadly defined to base our beliefs and our credences on. So that's the evidence and reason part. You might describe that, as I say, as a epistemological naturalism. Then the compassion for all sentient beings is just a common sense way of explaining that ultimately every sentient being should matter in our moral consideration, should warrant some basic compassion from us and sentience, we'll probably get onto this later, in simple terms is the capacity to have experiences or to have good or bad experiences. So any being that can suffer, that can feel pain or joy or anything at all really, should matter when it comes to thinking about morality and our ethics. So that's hopefully a headline summary and then a little bit more depth. It's epistemological naturalism, at least a sentiocentric moral scope. So we should include every sentient being in our scope of moral consideration and summarised as evidence, reason and compassion for all sentient beings. I know that the general idea of doing no harm and having compassion for all sentient beings has been around for a very long time, in some traditions for millennia even. But as I understand it, the actual word sentientism was coined fairly recently in the 1970s. I wonder if you could talk a bit about how that came about, because it's quite an interesting story. The word sentientism, as far as I can find from my research, was, as you say, first used in the 1970s by a couple of academics, one called Lewis and another one called Rodman. And interestingly, they were using the word sentientism to criticise it. So it was coined by the people who were resisting it. 
and they were using it to criticise the modern animal ethics movement that was growing up around people like Ros Godlevich and Richard Ryder and Peter Singer and others, all of whom were saying, look, sentience is what should matter here. You know, the reason we care about other humans is not we share the same species, but because of their capacity to suffer, to flourish, to feel things. And if that is the basis for our compassion for other humans, we should extend it out to all other sentient beings. So these academics, interestingly, were criticising sentientism and saying, look, this is really just another form of discrimination because you're discriminating against all of the non-sentient stuff that's out there and surely that should matter too. So if you think about this choice of where to set our moral scope, you might have a choice between anthropocentrism that focuses on humans, sentiocentrism that includes all sentient beings, but these people were pushing for something much broader than that, a biocentrism or even an ecocentrism that says ultimately all living things and maybe all, even all ecosystems, including non-living stuff like rocks and rivers and trees and concepts such as e ecosystems and species, all of those should matter too. So the criticism was saying, look, you're not going far enough. You're actually leaving out non-sentient stuff. So that was, I guess, the genesis of the word. But the people I mentioned before, Lovitch and Ryder and Singer and many other people around them, pushed ahead with defining a variety of different ethical stances that essentially centred on sentience. And nearly all of them were quite naturalistically focused as well. So they were quite often saying, look, this is also an alternative to maybe a religious or a supernatural ethic because it's grounded in the science of sentience and consciousness and evolution. You know, we don't need a supernatural basis for our compassion. We can just choose to care about all of these sentient beings in a scientific sense. So in a way, all I've done really is to make two tweaks to what they were already talking about. One, I've suggested that we take this naturalistic way of understanding the world, a scientific way of using evidence and reason to base our credences. But we don't just apply that to when we're thinking about our moral scope. We should apply that in every domain, because I think engaging honestly with reality, using evidence and reason is our best chance of getting close to the truth, whatever that might be, in every single domain, not just when we're thinking about morality and ethics. And the second thing I've suggested we do, where people like Ryder and Singer and other academics around them, centred on sentience, but then develop quite specific ethical systems that you then apply to that. So some went down a more utilitarian approach, some went down a more rights-based or a deontological approach, some people developed a feminist care ethic or a relational ethic, all of which still focused on this idea of sentience as a moral qualifier. I've suggested that sentientism itself should be quite ethically pluralistic. So as long as we include all sentient beings in our moral consideration and we take that seriously, it sort of doesn't matter quite so much which of those specific ethical systems you apply to it thereafter. So that's the development of the word. But as, as you've suggested there, these are not ideas that were invented in the 1970s or even in the European Enlightenment. They have a much, much older history in human cultures. So if I think you, you look at the naturalistic way of understanding the world, I'd argue that is as old as humanity itself. I think early humans were exploring their environment, using their senses to help them find ways to survive. Um, and arguably that is a naturalistic grounding for epistemology even before people had thought of the term epistemology. And even after the growth of a more supernatural thinking and religious modes of thinking, in almost every culture and almost every part of the world and every stage of history, there have been naturalistic thinkers who've turned away from the supernatural, fideistic and revealed or dogmatic ways of believing and have suggested that we should use evidence and reason to understand the world and we should adjust our beliefs and our credences based on evidence and reasoning too. So that naturalistic idea is ancient and various and global and richly deep through human cultures. But this idea of having a compassion that is universal and goes beyond the human is also extremely ancient and deep. And I think, again, you can find echoes of that in almost every culture and every period of history around the world. And one obvious example that will jump out at many people is the idea of a himsa. And in simple terms, it means do no harm. And it doesn't mean do no harm to humans. It means do no harm to any being that has the capacity to be harmed. And having the capacity to be harmed is an attribute of sentience. So in, in, in essence, that idea of ahimsa is centred on the concept of sentience, again, long, long before the word sentientism was coined. Yeah, it's, it's quite a new term in that sense, but I think the roots are deep and ancient and potentially even pre-human if you want to push it that far. Jamie, sentientism, as you've described it, is 
an approach to ethics which is driven primarily by reason and evidence. But there is this classic argument from history, from the philosopher David Hume, that we can't get an ought from an is. And what that means is that we can't actually derive morality simply by looking only at facts and evidence. In reality, the world just exists, and nothing about how the world exists can tell us how it ought to exist. So Jamie, how does your personal interpretation of sentientism bridge this gap between the impersonal facts of the world and how we ought to live within it? Well, I'll make two qualifying statements first. One is I'm not a philosopher. And the second thing is because of this pluralism of sentientism, many other sentientists will disagree with me on the is or chasm, all sorts of other different types of ethical topics and epistemological topics too. Personally, I'm reasonably comfortable drawing a link between the good and bad of experiences to the good and bad of morality and ethics. And I wonder sometimes if this worry about the is or boundary, even amongst people with a more secular mindset, is another sort of hangover of a religious mode of thinking about ethics, in that there's this sense that we must have some sort of external, locked down, forced approach to justify an ethical stance. And if we can't find one, we then start to panic and struggle and worry that that's a deep issue. So one, I think there are ways of bridging that chasm. And two, I'm not sure that the worry is really that deep either. To my mind, if morality is about anything, it's about whether and how we care about others. So in that sense, if someone chooses not to care about others, that is amorality. And if someone wants to actively harm or go against the interest of others, that's immorality. And if someone cares about only some sentient beings, I'd argue that's inconsistent morality and maybe an arbitrarily defined one too. So to my mind, it's almost baked into that definition of morality that it is about how we ought to treat others and how we ought to act with others. And then all we need to lead up to a compassionate ethic is one that recognises you know, a series of epistemological facts about what it is to be an evolved sentient being. I'm confident, you know, I know I don't like pain. I'm pretty confident you don't like pain too. And definitionally, I think morality is about whether or not I care about the fact you don't like pain. It's, it's almost that simple for me. And you can build out a lot of complexity around it, but I don't have this sense that there's some sort of yawning chasm that risks the whole enterprise. I think those links are quite robust for me personally. Yeah, I think that's really well said. And yeah, I've talked about this previously, but for me, I think what Hume's argument doesn't properly take into account is the nature of these certain conscious states, in particular, these valent states of pleasure and suffering, as you mentioned. And suffering, it does have this uniquely self-evident badness, what philosophers sometimes call ought not to be -ness that is inherent to the experience itself. You know, we don't infer or judge suffering to be bad. There's just this intrinsic disvalue that is the experience itself. And the opposite also seems true of pleasurable conscious states. And so, yeah, these hedonic or these valent states of consciousness perhaps don't encompass everything of ethical significance, but to me at least they have an importance that is morally objective in a certain sense. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, you can get into these conversations on Twitter where someone will say, OK, but is suffering really bad? And to, to be honest, my response is, well, that's in the definition of the word, right? <laughs> it's, it's, you, you can't really explain it. And if you're talking about something else, that's fine. You're talking about something else. But I, I agree. It's sort of almost definitionally central to what the word means. And I think that's partly why we use the words good and bad for the same things, right? Good and bad experiences and good and bad morality you know, we think of intuitively in related ways because they, they are related. What else could they be? So I wanted to ask you about this idea of human specialness. I think even if we strongly believe that other, perhaps simpler beings are sentient and have conscious experiences, very few people, including I think most sentientists, would say that the life of a mouse is of equivalent moral importance to a human life Presumably, Jamie, you don't consider mice and humans to be of equal ethical significance. So how do you personally think about that difference? So you'll find a wide variety of views among sentientists, because again, it focuses just on setting the moral scope. It doesn't necessarily tell us 
whether to take a more egalitarian approach or to rank or grade or how to trade off conflicting interests. So there's much work still to be done. It doesn't claim to be a sort of perfect or finished ethical system in that sense. So you will find people who are sentient who will push for a more egalitarian stance and will suggest that we should at least aspire to think of all sentient beings in a more equalized way. I think even those people often, when faced with the reality of a situation where you've got to take one of those trade-offs, <laughs> like the one you just you know, laid out, if you had to take a decision between saving a human child and a mouse, for example, they'd probably still follow your and my intuition to save the child. Others will suggest that like interests should be treated equally, but that doesn't mean the individuals need to be treated equally, because when we think about the massive diversity of different sentient beings, the diversity of interests is absolutely radical. So given those interests vary very widely, the nature of moral treatment could vary very widely too. And you can also link that to the variety of sentient experience itself, because I think it's fair to suggest that sentience isn't just a binary on off thing that you have it or you don't. And if you do have it, it's all the same. Again, we see that variety even within the human species, let alone across many other species. So I think many sentientists are open to the idea that if sentience is this rich, complex, multidimensional thing, that some beings might have a richer, more complex, maybe more intensely valenced version of sentience, and that could warrant them having a slightly higher moral priority over a, a being that has a very, very simplistic, maybe low-level, less intense degree of sentience. So there's a broad range of approaches. I do think there is something to that, that we need to recognise the degree, potential degrees and varieties of sentience, and that might justify differential treatment in some areas. We just need to be careful because one thing us humans are very good at is defining some new hierarchy that conveniently puts us at the top that justifies us exploiting others. So as long as we're, we're watching out for that and we're genuinely trying to do this in a high integrity way that genuinely tries to take the perspective of the other, even if they're very different from us, then I think we can you know, find sensible ways of navigating through that. Yeah, it does seem that to be consistent, we need to say that like suffering and like well-being counts the same, regardless of what species we're talking about. But I do think that there is an ethical difference between humans and other species. I think it's really, though, our instrumental value, like the amount of power that we wield in the world over other species, our cognitive abilities, our, our ability to reason, our technology. We just have a much greater reach in our influence to purposively affect other lives and other sentient beings and also the future of the planet. So I do think that that gives humans a unique moral status. I don't actually see us though above other species. I think in absolute terms, like I said earlier, I think our well-being and suffering counts the same. I, I almost feel like we're just born into a position of far greater moral responsibility. And if that is the only ethically relevant difference between ourselves and other sentient creatures, then we should be perhaps quite humbled by that and maybe reflect a bit more on the way that we abuse that power. I'd agree. There can be a, a theme amongst people with a sentiocentric concern who are worried about human impact on the rest of the planet and other species, for example, that suggest that humans take a almost back away from the world and just leave it alone because we've done so much harm. I have some sort of empathy for that, but there's a danger in it too, because I think it steps away from the responsibility that should come with that enormous power that we have. Because I completely agree. I think our, you know, our capabilities and the power for good or ill are absolutely overwhelming compared to any other type of being. Uh, that we're aware of on this planet. So we need to be extremely aware of hubris, but we also can't step away from that responsibility that that power should embed. And yeah, and I wouldn't want to flatten this thing out at all. Humans are incredible evolved beings and the things we're able to do and our capabilities and how we've managed to sort of bootstrap and hack capabilities that were developed for survival and reproduction and to do what we've done, again, for good or ill, is pretty mind-blowing. So, you know, I wouldn't walk away from the idea that we are deeply distinctive and special. But I agree that we have enormous power and with that power, you know, you would hope would come responsibility. I think many people tend to imagine humans as having a much richer palette of conscious experiences than other animals and that our greater cognitive abilities or relatively greater cognitive abilities 
somehow heighten or intensify our experiences above that of other species. And I think perhaps in some cases there is some some truth to that. But there are, I think, also some convincing reasons. And this is something I've heard you talk about, is to consider that other animals might actually experience suffering and certain emotions with greater intensity than humans do, because they don't have our same ability to reason. So, Jamie, could you describe the logic of that position and how you think that could be true? Yeah, I'm pretty confident there are some types of experiences humans have that most other non-human animals don't have. The feeling of existential angst might be something that is particularly human, I don't know. But I think the first point of caution is the more we understand about non-human animals, the richer their cognitive capabilities and their social behaviour and their communication seems to be. I can't remember the last time I read a research paper that said we thought this species could do X, but actually they can do less than that. It always seems to go the other way. So the first thing I would want to say is, again, to step away from the anthropocentrism, that assumption that we're distinctive and special, recognise that we're part of a richly evolved panoply of living beings, and some of their capabilities and experiences may be richer and more distinctive even than ours. And some of the things we think only we have, maybe they have too. So that's the first point of caution. But I, I do think the point you raise is another really important angle. Because when I think about sentience, again, other sentientists will disagree because you know we have different philosophies of mind and different views about where the science is. But I do think thinking about evolution is a really useful way of understanding what sentience is and how it came into being. And I guess my favourite hypothesis, and I've been lucky to talk to people like Walter V and Mark Solms and others on the sentientism podcast who developed this view, is that sentience itself probably evolved in the Cambrian or the pre-Cambrian as quite simple animals encountered a more complex decision environment where they had to evaluate different options and it proved adaptive for them to be able to have this feeling which was how are things going for me now and how are things going for me now and that helped them move towards good things and away from bad things in a super simple sense so i think that was to use a biblical reference that you know the genesis of sentience the adaptivity of that essential feel and you know, a few billion years later, here we are now feeling the existential angst. But I think that does bring into light that evolutionary role, the concern you had, which is that with humans or other animals with more advanced cognitive capabilities, we can use those cognitive capabilities to help with our evolutionary survival and um, reproduction. So maybe we need the raw fields of pain and pleasure a little bit less because we have those advanced cognitive capabilities. Whereas maybe with the simpler animals with less powerful cognitive capabilities, maybe for their survival, they depend even more on the simple pains and pleasures and the raw feels of their experiences. So maybe they actually feel those things in a more intense way. So that's one point of caution, something we need to be careful about as we jump to simple assumptions about uh, whether simpler animals feel pain less intensely than us. They may feel it more. Yeah, if it is the case that many non-human species do experience an intensity of suffering greater than we do, I think that could be hugely significant. And it was definitely, for me, pause for thought when I heard you discuss that on your podcast. I'm curious, Jamie, if you would describe your personal interpretation of sentientism as a kind of moral realism. So are there, in your opinion, discoverable objective truths to be learnt about morality? So this is another area where I'll have the real philosophers complaining about my imprecision and fuzziness and <laughs> messing up the terms. To be honest, I'm still not sure if I count as a moral realist or a moral anti-realist because I've described my position, um, I think, reasonably consistently and people have told me I'm both. So let me lay out how I think about it and you can help me understand whether I'm a moral realist or not. Um, so. I'm not a moral realist in a sort of pure platonic sense in that I don't think morality existed before sentient beings existed. So in that sense, I'm not a sort of extremely hard-edged moral realist. But at the same time, I guess I am sort of a moral realist in that I do ground my morality on a concern for others. And when I say others, I mean those who have their own perspective, those for whom things can go well or badly, those for whom can have good or bad experiences, who can have their own interests. And those beings, I think, 
they are real, right? They they are real and they really don't like suffering. They really don't want to die. So in that sense, that's where I find some degree of moral realist grounding is just in the existence and the nature and the characteristics of sentient beings. And as we said before, in just the very definition of what the word morality means. So whether that makes me a moral realist or not, I'm, I'm still not quite sure. But <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. I think quite often moral realism is framed as saying that morality is floating around us in the universe is some kind of supernatural ether. But to me, at least, I do identify as a moral realist. And it's not because I believe in, as you mentioned, this kind of platonic, supernatural moral law. But yeah. it's because I think value and disvalue really exist in conscious experience. And morality, for me, is or should be our logical response to the existence of this value, this ought to be ness or this ought not to be ness, which is intrinsic to certain conscious states. And so to me, morality has a kind of existence which is similar in a way to mathematics in the sense that it's an emergent scheme with potentially multiple solutions, but it's logically entailed from, from simpler values. It's grounded, I think, in something real, which is the intrinsic ought to be in us or ought not to be in us of these valent states of, of consciousness. Yeah, beautifully put. And, and yeah, just to add, regarding these hedonic or, or valent states, of course, I don't think either of us are saying that feeling pleasure is in any way a reliable indicator that we're actually doing something good. You know, we could be ruining our life with heroin, for example. And, and similarly, at least for now, suffering clearly performs a range of essential biological functions. But I think we have all sorts of false associations around pleasure and suffering. But I do think that well-being and suffering states of consciousness in themselves have a, an intrinsic value and disvalue. And they are at least part of the raw material of ethics in the universe, in my view. Yeah, I'd agree. And I like the way you put that because I think they're intrinsic to those things they're associated with. They don't have to be something separate or externally imposed or, or distinct. You know, I think they just are intrinsically aspects of those things that you described, yeah. I've heard you uh, talk in the past about the dangers of moral relativism and how it can stand in the way of a more objective moral progress. Could you explain what moral relativism is and why you see it as a potential problem? Yeah, there are many different varieties of moral relativism and there are sort of more constructive approaches and others that I think are more dangerous. I think moral relativism uh, often is motivated by a genuine humility and, and people saying, look, you know, I have my own particular moral stance. It's because of how I was brought up, because of my culture, because of things I've thought and the things I've experienced. But, you know, why should that give me the right to judge others? I should, with humility, try to understand others and other groups and other cultures, how they see morality and just be open-minded about that. And I'd go along with that completely. I think that sort of open-mindedness to different ideas, different ways of thinking, different cultural approaches to morality absolutely makes sense. And that motivation, I think, is genuine. The danger is where that humility leads us to such a degree of neutrality that we refuse to have any standard of judgment of the moral system of somebody else, regardless of the suffering it causes or regardless of the actual content of that ethical system. And to my mind, if we, if we go to that level of moral relativism where we say, well, it's just up to them to agree amongst themselves and who am I to judge? Essentially, we've adopted, in my view, an amoral stance because we're just backing away from moral judgment whatsoever and saying people can come up with whatever they want to come up with. And it seems to be moving into a sort of purely descriptive view of ethics, which is about power and groups and negotiation and law and how different groups and countries and nations and cultures think about ethics. That's descriptively true. But it abandons the normative stance on ethics, which is the whole point of ethics in the first place, which is how to live a good life and what's right and wrong and good and bad. So it's, it's only that sort of more extreme version of a moral relativism that I'm nervous about, because it can get to the point where even if an ethical system is deeply and obviously brutal and causes vast needless suffering to people within its own group and or people outside, and a pure moral relativist would stand there neutrally saying, but who am I to judge? So it's that, that sort of pure moral relativism, I guess I just see the danger in.
Yeah, completely agree. And one thing that becomes apparent, I think, once you start trying to think rationally and impartially about ethics is that as human beings, we have a whole range of evolutionary biases that make it very difficult for us to think rationally about ethics. And so, for example, we tend to discount the importance of other beings on the basis of how far away they are from us in space or how similar they are to us or if they're distant to us in time and they live in the future. And I think most ethical theorists would say that none of these criteria have any intrinsic ethical importance. And yet these biases seem to be hardwired into our psychology. So yeah, Jamie, how do you think about these evolutionary biases? Uh, are there any maybe more that come to mind for you? And what, in your opinion, is the best way to navigate around them? Well, in a way, this is one of the most fascinating aspects of us humans is the fact that we have collectively evolved at least a sort of default basis for our morality. It's useful to be able to collaborate in groups. It's useful for families to look after each other, even extended families. It can be useful to have some sort of in-group, out-group aggression under certain circumstances to defend yourself. So you can see all of those descriptive evolutionary reasons for why our proto-morality came about. I feel like that was the sort of legacy we were gifted as animals. But one of the most fascinating things about humans is that we have bootstrapped that and hacked it to say, well, okay, descriptively, that's how we've come to be. But normatively, how, how do we want to be? And I guess that is what ethics and morality are all about. But it is an interesting dance between the two because that descriptive reality about our evolutionary biases is still enormously powerful in our social norms and even in our biology. So it's hard to detach from it completely. But I do think the intellectual attempt to disconnect from that to some degree and think more rationally about our ethics instead of just how have I evolved to feel is one of the most powerful and important human enterprises there is. So I do think it's good to try and counter those biases and to challenge them. At the same time, I wouldn't necessarily throw them out without thought because sometimes there are actually rational bases underneath some of these biases that it might make sense to hold on to, at least pay attention to. For example, when we're thinking about future generations, I think it makes sense to grant future generations of sentient beings moral consideration, just as people can care about the environment because of, to some degree, their own grandkids. It's just an extension of that. But at the same time, it might make sense to hedge the weighting of the value based on the probability of those beings existing. So in that sense, there's an example where, you know, a purist stance might go full egalitarian about future generations, but you might actually find a rational basis for running things into being a little bit more presentist and a little bit more focused on, you know, those around us now. So I, I'm not sure if that's a clear answer, but I do think it's, it's good for us to challenge these biases and work out if there's actually a rational basis for them, or if, again, it is just some sort of evolved legacy of the way we, we like to think. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with you that we have special duties to certain beings which are closely within the reach of our influence, like our own children and so on. Mm. And yeah, I think our ability to, to feel pleasure and suffering and have compassion for our family and our community, it does give us a glimpse into, I think, a truly normative ethical reality. And yet it's quite distorted by these evolutionary pressures to survive and reproduce, which we still have. And so, for example, I think a lot of the time we do have the right ethical intuitions, for example, that we should take care of our children, but we don't have any evolved ethical intuitions about those beings whose well-being doesn't directly affect our own survival, because there's no evolutionary feedback there to shape our psychology. Yeah. But if we are trying to be more impartial and objective, then I think we need to recognize that if a sentient being is within our ability to affect it, then we do have an ethical duty to them. And especially in wealthier developed countries where the reach of our influence has really exploded over a very short time, I think it's kind of a major issue that we just don't intuitively feel or sense this much greater ethical responsibility that we've acquired very recently. Yeah, I'd agree. I'd agree. And I think, as I said, that's one of the most important sort of enterprises of human thought is challenging that and working it through. And it's difficult because at the same time, we need to have, you know, compassion for our fellow humans that we are a certain type of evolved animal. You know, maybe there is only a certain pace we can go at and there are certain things that are so counterintuitive that it's hard for us to do. So maybe even that sort of descriptive evolved start still does have some sort of drag on us in practical terms. 
but I think the idea of trying to push and challenge and, and stretch that is, um, is deeply important and we can do so much better. And I think the other thing is people will sometimes push back on having this much broader, you know, sentiocentric moral scope because they're worried about how demanding it might be. And that's a fair challenge, right? It, something so radical can feel demanding and challenging. It, it can almost lead people to just turn away from the idea because it sounds just too hard to do. And I guess my appeal is one, look, maybe we should just try and face up to that because in a way that's how moral progress is made. But the second one is to suggest that actually the, the minimal baseline for showing compassion for others doesn't actually need to be very demanding at all for us to make substantial progress. So what I mean by that is, depending on which ethical system you look at, you can think about obligations or responsibilities. You can think about whether we have an obligation to help others proactively or to care about all sorts of different interests or needs they might have. But most ethical systems would agree that at least as a baseline, if you include someone in your moral consideration, if you have compassion for them, if you care about them, even in the most minimal sense, then at the very least, you wouldn't needlessly harm or kill that being. You might not feel an obligation to help them, or you might not go out of your way to support them. You might do nothing else, but at least you wouldn't needlessly harm or kill them. And that starts, I think, is a sort of reassuring minimal baseline that says, look, let's have a very broad moral scope, even if we only start with that minimally demanding ask. Now, that minimally demanding ask still has very radical implications for the way humanity operates today, but I think at least it's a starting point where we can say, look, surely we could at least aspire to that basic level of you know, what moral consideration and what compassion actually mean. So one thing sentientism, I think, is really saying is that our moral circle needs to, at the very least, expand to include all conscious sentient beings. But a lot of people, I think, would want to include a great many other things within our moral circle, things that do not in themselves have consciousness or sentience. And so you sometimes hear environmentalists campaigning to get maybe a river or a forest to be legally recognised as a person or having rights in some way. Jamie, how do you think about that? Is this the correct way to go about protecting these things or... Do we, need a, do we need to draw a clearer line between what is of intrinsic ethical importance and things that are perhaps enormously valuable, but that their value is ultimately of an instrumental kind? So sentientism itself says that we should have compassion for all sentient beings. It doesn't say we shouldn't have moral consideration for insentient beings. So some sentientists will go further. Thus, look, we have moral consideration, serious moral consideration for all sentient beings, but they will actually extend further than that. And they might do that based around ideas of dignity or autonomy, uh, even for beings that might not be sentient. Um, and they might also do that in a sort of biocentric or an ecocentric sense where they will say, look, you know, I think ecosystems have intrinsic moral worth themselves. Personally, I'm more strict than that because I think that ultimately all of the intrinsic terminal value that we're talking about does come back to the subjective experiences of sentient beings. So I'm a bit more strict about that. And I think that ultimately we should include all sentient beings in our moral scope, but nobody or nothing, actually nothing else, because everyone inside the moral scope is a someone and everything that is not sentient is essentially a thing. But at the same time, I would actually share a rich concern for all sorts of insentient stuff. The environment is a great example. So I and most other even strict sentientists would have a rich appreciation for the importance of protecting our environment. But we might do that in an instrumental way because we see the environment as being deeply important for not just human sentience and not just the sentience that live in human spheres of influence, but also the quadrillions of free-ranging sentience that live less impacted by humans too. So we'd care about the environment because of its instrumental impact on all of those sentient beings, as opposed to having an intrinsic sense of moral worth or moral value for the ecosystem itself. So I think there's still quite a lot of overlap there, but there is an important distinction. And I think if someone sees intrinsic moral value in an ecosystem, to be consistent, they would also have to see intrinsic moral value in the ecosystem on the planet of Venus, for example, where we are pretty confident there's no sentient life at all, because it's the system that has the intrinsic value, regardless of whether there's any sentient being there whatsoever. And on that basis, you would arguably have to care about every other planet in every other galaxy in the solar system just as much as our own, because 
they're all ecosystems. And if ecosystems matter intrinsically, then they all matter just the same. Whereas in fact, the reason we care about the Earth's ecosystem, I think it in reality is because of all the sentient beings that live within it. So it's probably too long an answer, but I guess my main concern with mainstream environmental movement and people who go to a biocentric or an ecocentric start is that I'm often pretty convinced that what they're doing isn't really a genuine extension of their moral scope of consideration. It's really a, another veneer on an anthropocentric stance because the concern for the ecosystem isn't really a concern for the ecosystem. It's often a concern for you know, the ecosystem services that humans need for a planet we can live on with the right fresh water and with a, a comfortable temperature range. And frankly, for the aesthetic, nature is pretty that humans like. Right? I think a lot of environmental concern is ultimately trackable back to human concerns, not an intrinsic concern for the ecosystem as an entity in itself. And where you can see that most brutally exposed is where someone who claims to have a compassion for all living things or all, even all ecosystems and all entities in the environment conveniently excludes vast swathes of sentient beings, both in free ranging in the world or particularly in our own farms and labs from their moral consideration. So it seems they have a rich concern for the human species. Their concern for the environment is really just because they want humans to be happy and comfortable and have pretty nature to look at. But actually, the concern for the other sentient beings, the non-human sentient beings, seems to fall away very rapidly. And I, I just don't think that's consistent. So I don't mind people going further, but all of the sentient beings have to get serious, at least minimal moral consideration. That's the primary focus of sentientism on the ethical side. Yeah, I definitely agree with you that we should be more concerned about sentient beings getting left out of our moral circle than having too many things inside it. To be honest, though, I am fairly convinced, like you, that actually intrinsic value cannot intelligibly exist apart from conscious experience or sentience. Personally, I see values sort of in an analogous way to colour, in that it took us a very long time, centuries, for scientists to really understand that colours don't exist on the surfaces of objects in the way that they naively seem to us, and in reality, colour is an appearance in consciousness. Yeah, I just can't see any intelligible way that value could exist separately from conscious experience. I just don't know yeah. what that would be. I like that what, the way you put that, because in a way, f for there to be value, there has to be some form of entity that is doing the valuing. And I think that links directly back into what we were talking about with the central ideas of morality here. That I, I do think that morality, in a way, is about us aspiring to value the experiences and interests of others in the same way they do themselves. And for that to work, they have to value their own experiences and interests. So, you know, if I'm thinking about a pig in a farm, for example, I am very, very confident that pig genuinely has an interest in not suffering, in not being killed, in spending quality time with their family, right? So those are interests that the pig ha genuinely and actually has. And we can build scientific evidence to support that case if we're skeptical about it through observation through understanding their information architecture through just spending quality time with them right whereas when maybe an ecocentrist talks about a river having an interest in being clean or reaching the sea that interest that value is only in the mind of the human that's saying the sentence the river doesn't care either way right it's not genuinely an aspect of the river at all it's a human imposition and arguably even an anthropocentric imposition to take the things we value and force it into inanimate objects, as opposed to the genuine moral exercise of trying to, as far as we can, understand, empathise, sympathise with and have compassion for entities that actually do value their own selves and their own experiences. I think there's a radical difference between those things. We've briefly touched on the idea of the moral circle. I think another valuable concept that we might bring here is what the philosopher John Rawls called the veil of ignorance. Perhaps you could summarise what the veil of ignorance is and how it might be applied to sentientism. Yes, yeah, so the veil of ignorance is a classic philosophical thought experiment. I guess it's an intuition pump. It's a way of challenging our thinking in the way we were talking about earlier on, of trying to get us to move away from this sort of this individual stance to something that might be more broad, might be more impartial, might be more fair, might be more just. So the idea is that you are going to be allowed to design a society or a world with a variety of different types of people within it. 
But the trick is you, you don't know which of the types of beings you're going to be or which of the types of people you're going to be in that target world because your own identity is hidden from you by a veil of ignorance. And the idea is supposed to be that because you don't know who you would be in that future world, you would presumably design it in a fair and just way, just in case you're one of the less powerful or the weaker or the less privileged people in that society. And that might lead us to think about principles that could design a just society. So I think that's the basic idea. Right. So I guess the idea is that we would have a, a, a more objective view of our society or our culture if we imagine ourselves to be somehow standing outside of it, in particular, yeah. without knowing what role in society we would have. Yeah, this is quite obviously a, a useful tool for thinking about human society, but the veil of ignorance, it's a conceptual tool that can quite naturally be extended to include non-human sentient beings that are either a, a part of our society in some sense or simply affected by it. And then you have to ask yourself, you know, would I want to be a chicken in this society or a dairy cow? And yeah, I think the answer is quite obviously definitely not. Yeah, and I, I think that should be informative. I agree. And it's, it's, it's an obvious next step. And quite a few philosophers have taken that step. One of the frustrations many people will find as you read the big name philosophers like Rawls is that quite a few of them were really weak when it came to considering non-human animals. You know, the, the, the cultural anthropocentrism, this focus on humans is so overpowering that many of the great works of philosophy just intuitively and unthinkingly assumed that only humans mattered. So it's, it's quite often taken a, you know, more modern generations of philosophers to go back to that work and to say, look, if you really want to be consistent, you've got to extend that concept. So people like um, you know, Mark Rowland and Dombrowski and Martha Nussbaum have done exactly that. They've gone back to Rawls's structure and said, look, let's extend this so that the veil of ignorance obscures your species too. And that can take you to some properly radical places that would lead us to see, I think appropriately, with abject horror, many of the things that humanity considers normal today. Um, but as with any sort of intuition, pump or thought experiment, there, there are limits to it. You know, you can imagine someone still be willing to take the gamble that they might end up in the right spot in their designed world. It might not be completely egalitarian. They might be willing to take some risk that they, you know, win the lottery they've set up. And of course, the real challenge is that none of us are actually in that veil of ignorance situation. You know, the real challenge of ethics isn't how would you design society from behind the veil? The real challenge of ethics is now you do know your position and your privilege and your luck, whether or how to be moral even then. So there are limitations to it, but I think it's a very powerful way of thinking that, yeah, I agree, it should be extended to include all other sentient beings too. Um, and it's it's partly because it's doing that classic trick, you know, the, the essence of morality surely has to be a genuine attempt to try and understand the perspective of the other. And this veil of ignorance is another great way of doing that. You know, imagine you designed this world, but you ended up being in this horribly disadvantaged position. It's, it's trying to force us desperately to consider the perspective of the other. And that has to be central to any uh, naturalistic morality, as far as I'm concerned. Jamie, I know that you're a, a vocal advocate for veganism. What is the relationship between sentientism and veganism? If we are a sentientist, are we also necessarily a vegan? I'd say yes. And it's a quite straightforward link for me, because veganism itself is a philosophical stance and a practical philosophical stance. I'd describe it as veganism is doing what we can, what's practical and reasonable to avoid causing exploitation, suffering and death to non-human animals, and then taking the practical steps we can to put that into action. So if we have a sentiocentric moral concern that cares about all sentient beings, that should imply we wouldn't want to cause exploitation, suffering and death to those sentient beings. And in essence, that's what veganism is. So I think there's quite a strong and clear link. There are differences between sentientism and veganism. But yeah, for me, my although my veganism sort of came first, my veganism is now based on my sentientism. And I do think it's a, a logical, practical imp implication of taking a sentientist stance. Mm. I think vegans and really the majority of morally serious thinkers are 
horrified by the suffering that humans impose on other species. Factory farming in particular, I think, is one of the great moral emergencies of our time. But there is, of course, an enormous amount of suffering that takes place in Darwinian nature. And it does seem that in order to be consistent, we should be concerned about and ultimately try to reduce wild animal suffering as well. I think most people, including many vegans, would probably consider that to be a step too far. But Jamie, I wonder how you think about wild animal suffering. Is it our place as humans to eventually perhaps do something about it? Where do you stand on wild animal suffering? I do think we need to include them in our moral scope. And that is one, one of the interesting differences between sentientism and veganism that we mentioned before, because veganism is explicitly about human-caused harms and trying to end them. People will talk about animal liberation. So that's not about making animals happy. That's just setting them free and getting out of the way as humans. You know, it's ending our human-caused exploitation, killing and harming. And I think that's a laudable and deeply important aim, given the egregious harms we're carrying out, as you've mentioned there already. And the only tangential point I'd mention is that many people, are, in theory, will reject factory farming as an egregious and sickening and obvious harm, also a needless one, but will at the same time fail to recognise that the very worst parts of factory farming are also standard practices in non-factory farming too. So again, when we think about it from the perspective of the animal themselves, the stages they have to go through in those processes are remarkably similar, whether it's a factory farm or a non-factory farm. And arguably the worst parts of the process from their perspective are consistent across the two, even if they might have a little bit more space to run around in between in the non-factory farmed approach. But let me come back to your central question, because that is actually quite a big tension in the vegan and animal advocacy movements. Veganism is very focused on ending human-caused harms and exploitations of, of animals. And there are, in a way, two different paths you can take. One is to say these human-caused harms are egregious, we should end them, and we are so sceptical of human interventions in nature and in the wild and with other animals that essentially the best thing we can do is to back away completely, end our exploitation, and the story stops there. The other perspective is to say, well, actually, the reason I want to end those human-caused harms is ultimately because I have compassion for these very obviously sentient beings. And if I have compassion for all sentient beings, that means I have compassion for sentient beings whether or not they're being harmed or exploited by humans. And yeah, that should, I think, lead us into having compassion, moral consideration for sentient beings that live free-ranging in the wild as well. Now, whether to do something about that or what to do about that is the next step. But I would insist strongly that even though that topic is difficult, challenging, and it's an immature space, even in academia, none of those things are a reason for us to withdraw our moral consideration from that class of sentient beings. I mean, they're the most numerous sentient beings on our planet by far. Just to lay out the rough numbers, there's about 8 billion sentient human beings at any one moment. There's about 80 to 100 billion obviously sentient farmed land animals. There's maybe one to two, probably more trillion farmed and fished aquatic animals that we harm and kill, again, largely needlessly. But those numbers are all dwarfed by the very rough estimates of how many sentient beings there might be free-ranging in what we call the wild. And those numbers get up into the sort of quintillion, sextillion sort of numbers. I mean, it's just breathtakingly complex and the scale is mind-blowing. So for us to look at that space and either say, look, that's just too scary to engage with, or because we have this sort of naive view that nature is perfect and wonderful, so let's just leave it alone, in essence abandons <laughs> most of the sentient beings on planet Earth uh, and excludes them from our moral consideration. So, um, yeah, a long answer, but we need to include them in our moral consideration, but then just think with humility and care about what and how to do about that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think we really should care about wild animal suffering. I think it is a very salient moral cause. You know, in the short term, like you, I'm certainly quite hesitant that we could intervene in these very complex ecosystems without potentially doing a lot of damage. But as a potential cause for perhaps a more advanced and wiser civilization, I think reducing natural suffering could eventually become a moral priority of our civilization. I definitely don't subscribe to this 
almost religious view that nature is perfect and could never be improved on. I just don't think that we are currently wise enough or advanced enough to attempt this full-scale paradise engineering right now. But in the future, maybe that will change and our descendants will manufacture truly benevolent biospheres. Who knows? Yeah. And, and I know we, we share a guest in David Pierce, and he's, I guess, done some of the most cutting edge thinking on this sort of stuff and is very unashamed about, one, the level of the moral challenge to us, and two, the potential we might have given our enormous power and rapidly developing power to actually do something about that. So, you know, he will comfortably go into transhumanist ideas about gene editing or re-engineering the biosphere and so on. And, and many people will balk at that because again, of this scepticism about our human track record. It's totally understandable, right? You look at what we've done, I completely understand. And I share that sense of fear of human hubris. But I think to go too far the other way and just to withdraw from the idea, either because of that sort of pseudo-religious nature is good view, or because of a terror of human intervention, is abandoning many innocents as well. I guess the other thing I'd say is, I've had some fascinating conversations with people like um, Carl Johansson and Jeff Sebo and others who've thought very deeply about this space. And they make the point that this isn't a question about whether to intervene or not. We are already, as humans, intervening, whether we like it or not, at massive scale. You know, and whether that's our impact on the climate, whether it's deforestation, whether it's biodiversity loss, whether it's other more subtle changes, right? We're intervening already, so we cannot avoid the topic. We have to think about our impacts on animals living free-ranging in the wild, whether we like it or not. And the other aspect is that we are already doing low risk, high confidence interventions to help that we could easily build on. So there are already exercises that are looking at vaccinating wild animals, for example, against disease. Now, that's largely done for human purposes to reduce the risk to us and, and livestock, but it does actually also benefit the animals too. There are ideas about wildlife corridors or using forms of contraception as a more humane way of managing populations instead of relying on you know starvation or predation so there are already low risk compassionate benevolent interventions that are being developed that i think we should continue to research on and, and work on and i think the final reason why the wild animal topic is interesting is one of the weird things about humans is that non-vegan humans are already intuitively compassionate about wild animals we have a local WhatsApp group in the area where I live here, and the outpouring of concern for a duck that gets hit by a car or for a fox that's injured in a back garden is absolutely overwhelming. It gives me enormous hope because those people intuitively and directly recognise that this is a sentient being that is suffering, and they're very comfortable calling wildlife rescue or trying to assist in some way if they can. So we have this weird dichotomy where non-vegan humans intuitively, directly and intrinsically seem to care about free-ranging wild animals while brutally paying for the exploitation, slaughter and suffering of very obviously sentient farmed animals, whereas many vegans are richly and deeply concerned with the non-human animals that are being harmed by humans, but almost want to back away from a concern about animals living free in the wild because they're so worried about human hubris and intervention. So in a way, it gives me some hope because if the average human does at least have some intrinsic care for an injured wild animal they might find while we're walking in a suburb or in a, in a wood, it gives me hope that there's some latent morality there that we can tap into. Ultimately, no one really wants to needlessly harm or kill sentient beings. And if we can strip some of the social norms and human psychological defences away from that and get back to that basics, those basics, there's some hope there, I think. Let me just say before we move on, you mentioned that you and I have both had the philosopher David Pierce on our respective podcasts. And yeah, he speaks very convincingly about reducing wild animal suffering as an important ethical cause. And so if people are interested in this slightly radical sounding line of thinking, then those conversations with David go a lot deeper into that. And so I will link those in the description of this episode. The other thing I'd say about David is there is genuine deep concern at the moment in the zeitgeist and in the discourse about transhumanist modes of thinking generally. And I think that's partly because people look at Elon Musk or others like him and they think these people don't have a genuine compassion for all humanity or certainly not all sentient beings. They basically want themselves and a bunch of tech bro mates to be able to go to Mars and do loads of great man of history stuff, right? So they're worried that this sort of transhumanist, unashamedly tech-enabled 
futuristic vision of the long-term future and future generations and so on is really some sort of tech bro wet dream that is really elitist in it as a project, not compassionate. And David is, a, I think, the perfect counterfoil to that because he's an example of a transhumanist who whose transhumanism I think is motivated genuinely and deeply by a rich, universal, foundational, benevolent compassion. So for those people who are a bit turned off by the tech bros, there is another flavour of compassionate transhumanism that I think David represents. Some people criticise sentientism as being anthropocentric. So I think the claim is that because subjective experiences like pleasure and suffering loom very large in our human experience that we mistakenly project these criteria of importance onto everything else. And yeah, I should say I don't agree with this argument. I'm, I'm playing a bit of devil's advocate here, but how do you respond to this criticism that sentientism is an anthropocentric or, or a human-centric ethical position? I think it's worth taking it seriously as a challenge because that risk is always there. Right? Us humans love coming up with new creative ways of recentering ourselves while pretending to decenter ourselves. And you can see how that one might play out, right? Because if someone says, well, the thing I'm most confident of is my own sentience, my experiences and my interests matter to me. So yes, I'm going to be sentiocentric. And the way I'm going to start judging sentience is basically how like me are you? Because I know I'm sentient, so I'm the reference point. And then I'm going to decide how like me are you to judge whether or not you get my compassion. That how like you are me type morality, we know the dangers of that, right? Because that can lead to racism, sexism, all sorts of other sort of in-group, in-group, out-group distinctions, which are basically, as I've said, right, it's like it's a question of similarity to me as the, as the, as the characteristic or the qualifier for value and um, consideration. So there's, there are dangers there. But Ultimately, I don't think it's a valid challenge, as long as we avoid that trap of how like you and me, because sentience and sentientism undercuts and destroys anthropocentrism. Because firstly, sentience was around for hundreds of millions of years before humans even existed. So centering our moral concern on a characteristic that predated humanity cannot be anthropocentric. Secondly, even today, given the stats we talked about earlier on, humans are a vanishingly tiny percentage of sentient beings, even on this planet. Maybe there are some on others too. So in that context, if humans are a vanishingly tiny percentage of current sentient beings, again, focusing on sentience and sentient beings decenters humans. It doesn't put humans at the centre. So that would be the centre of my pushback. I think it absolutely destroys anthropocentrism. It's explicitly a challenge to anthropocentrism. It centres sentience, which predated humanity. But the challenges do have a point. We've got to look out for that how like you are me way of thinking. And us humans tend to love to do that. Yeah, it almost seems like it's the more anthropocentric position to associate sentience with, with human beings. Yeah. I wanted to get your thoughts about artificial sentience. So some of the researchers that I've worked with, albeit quite briefly, do believe that in the future, if they are possible, there could be trillions of artificial sentient minds, either in simulations or in other forms of futuristic technology. How much attention do you think we should be giving to the possibility of future artificial sentience or AI becoming conscious? Is this a distraction from other more important issues or is it something that we should be giving serious attention to? I do think we should give serious attention to it, even though it is a topic that really irritates my friends and allies working for you know, animal liberation and you know, ending the human oppression of non-human animals. Because those people will again go back to the stats we talked about before and look at you know look at the suffering and the the challenges that even 8 billion humans are facing we have so many horrible problems still to deal with there then we have the challenges of farmed agriculture and and fishing and the need to transition to end all of that then potentially we have this challenge of the quadrillions or quintillions or sextillions of wild animal suffering and you seriously want me to take potentially artificial sentience seriously as a moral issue so I completely appreciate that, given the priorities we're facing and the egregious harms that we're continuing to carry out. But I do think it's an important topic to focus on. One, it's important in its own right, because it might actually come to pass and it might happen quicker than we realise. And the best time to stop 
factory farming is before you've started it. We've already gone through this horrible process of industrializing animal agriculture. We're now scaling up insect farming, which could be the next wave of human atrocity. And it is, I think, entirely possible that we could do something related for artificial sentience as well. Some people think that we may have even started that process now, and there may be some artificial sent sentience that are already suffering today. So one, I think it's difficult because there's an instinctive re push back to it, which is, this sounds like bullshit sci-fi, I've got bigger problems to deal with. But I think when you engage seriously with the issues, particularly if you have a naturalistic understanding of sentience and you recognise maybe it is a, a class of information processing, there's no in principle reason why you couldn't instantiate that in a non-biological substrate. So I do think we need to look at it seriously because, like I said, let's stop the bad thing before we create a new one. But I think there's a broader reason why it's important to engage with, and that's because it's another way that we can draw people back to some of these epistemological and ethical foundations. Because when we're talking about artificial intelligence and whether they could be sentient, we're talking about AI safety or AI risk. And to be fair, people generally are much more worried about the risk AI might, powerful AI might present to us than they are the harms we might do to sentient AI, with good reason. When we're talking to those people, many of them are just taking a standard anthropocentric view and then making that leap to extend their moral consideration and they're thinking about the topic because it's fascinating and because it's interesting and because it's a bit sci-fi and because it leads into their sort of philosophical modes of thinking. So it's very useful to be able to draw a new group of people who have substantial academic influence, increasingly political influence, who are engaging in the artificial intelligence space and drawing them back to, frankly, the animal issue. Because if we want to have consistent ethics, Anyone who has even a, a glimmer of concern for potentially sentient future artificial intelligences surely must have a rich, powerful concern for the very obviously sentient beings that we share our planet with today. So at the very least, it's another opportunity to say, you know, this is an emerging, interesting new idea, maybe an imperative, but let's draw you back to those philosophical foundations. And it's just another way of enlisting them in the non-human animal topic as well as extending that concern potentially beyond biology. Yeah, I can definitely understand the frustration from some people that this is a bit of a distraction when we have trillions or maybe more sentient beings in the world right now that are being largely neglected by us. Yeah. But having said that, I do think that this could be an extremely important cause. As you pointed out, artificial intelligence is developing extremely rapidly and it could make certain things possible even in the relative short term, that we'd previously thought were either very far off or perhaps even impossible. And another thing to mention is, you know, the researchers that I do know that are deeply into thinking about the ethics of artificial sentience, they do believe that we might be in a uniquely pivotal moment in history for establishing how these potential future beings will be treated. And so, as you said, a better place to stop something from happening is before it's already happening. The other thing to say is just that those researchers who primarily at the center for reducing suffering, they're also very concerned about things like factory farming and other present day issues. And to be honest, I'd be very surprised if a single one of them was not a vegan. And so, yeah, I think we can work on multiple ethical causes. And, and yeah, I think it could be a serious mistake to dismiss this moral issue simply because it isn't occurring in the present. Yeah, and in a, in a way, that's quite an interesting test, because if someone is engaged in the topic of you know, artificial sentience or robot rights, but doesn't express compassion for non-human animals, it's probably likely that their interest is purely intellectual or theoretical or philosophical or academic. It's not really grounded in an ethical stance at all. Whereas, as you said, the people at the Centre for Reducing Suffering, they've started with this rich sentiocentric compassion, which they do express for non-human animals and human animals, and now they're extending that in a high integrity way to consider digital sentience too. So I think that's quite an interesting sanity check for where someone's coming from on this topic, because I don't think you can consistently care about potentially sentient digital intelligences if you don't already express that in practical terms for the beings we are very confident are sentient around us today that we harm needlessly. Jamie, what do you think would be different about our world if everyone adopted this sentiocentric approach to ethics? So I think the sentiocentric part 
really shifts who we care about in a fundamental way. It takes it from our traditional model of caring about subgroups of humans and then I guess after the Second World War, the Universal Declaration of Rights, at least theoretically considering all humans, all 8 billion humans, and it pushes us to care about all of the sentient beings in our farms and our labs and in our homes, but even beyond that, as we've talked about, to free-ranging animals living in the wild and the vast numbers of them there. So I think the single most obvious thing it would do does bring us back to the way we exploit and use non-human sentient animals today. That's probably the most visceral and obvious clash with current default human norms, because while most young humans and even most adult humans would agree with us that we shouldn't needlessly harm and kill another sentient being and that causing suffering and death and going against their interests is intrinsically somehow a bad thing to do, we've somehow built up a set of human psychological tricks and very, very powerful social norms that indoctrinate almost everybody around the world to think that it's completely normal, even acceptable, even desirable, to, at industrial scale, harm, abuse, both mentally and physically, and ultimately kill vast swathes of trillions of very obviously sentient beings for largely trivial human ends. So I think on the sentiocentric side of sentientism, that's probably the one biggest change that we'd see in a sentientist world would be some form of just transition that ultimately aims to end all those forms of exploitation and harm. Um, and with some of that stuff, it's quite easy. Plants are edible, for example, and with other aspects in certain cultures and certain countries around the world, we're going to have to take different transition paths. But I think ultimately the aim would be to transition to end all of that stuff. And the good thing about it is that that's not just good for non-human animals, that's also good for us humans and for the planet we all share, because as research continues into challenges around water and land pollution and water use and emissions and land use and deforestation and biodiversity and zoonosis and antimicrobial resistance and you know the list goes on, the imperative to end those industries even from a human health and an environmental and a climate standpoint are overwhelming even if we don't adopt a sentiocentric ethic. So I think the sentiocentric ethics just gives the deepest and the most powerful and the most fundamental push to that imperative. So that's probably the, the big beast on the sentiocentric implications. But the naturalistic side of sentientism, I think, has some pretty radical and deep implications too, because it insists on using evidence and reason to ground our credences and thereby rejects you know, a faith-based fideistic approach or a dogmatic approach where our opinions don't change with the evidence. It would reject a lot of the problems we're seeing in terms of misinformation, disinformation. It explicitly and directly challenges those ways of doing epistemology. I don't want to aggrandize them by <laughs> calling them epistemology because arguably they're not. So that bumps up, up against many supernatural worldviews, many religious and spiritual worldviews. It bumps up against many forms of unfounded conspiracism. It bumps up against alternative medicine and astrology and themes around anti-vaxxing. So uh, again, there are all sorts of contentious issues there that the epistemology bumps up against pretty hard as well. And it does that for two reasons. One, because I just think using evidence and reason is the best way of understanding the world. And if we want to make the world a better place, it's useful to understand it well. So there's a pure technical reason why I think naturalistic epistemology just gives us the best chance of doing that. But it's also because even if someone has a richly compassionate ethic, if they're just wrong about the world, that can lead good people to do terrible things. And we see so many examples of that, where someone's compassionate ethics may then be constrained or made conditional by a religious or a supernatural worldview, or their belief about how reality actually works leads them to cause egregious, needless harm. And that's partly why I frame sentientism as both having this epistemological stance and an ethical stance, because I don't think either is good enough by itself. If you have a naturalistic stance, you might just arbitrarily choose not to care about some sentient beings. And even if you have a rich compassion for all sentient beings, if you're just wrong about reality because you have a dogmatic belief or because you believe something you've been told that is poorly founded, or you believe there's a supernatural being that should override your compassion for other sentient beings, terrible things can happen. So I think we both need a rich sentiocentric compassion as well as you know, a naturalistic commitment to understanding the world we all share, hence evidence, reason and compassion for all sentient beings. Wonderful.
I think a lot of people would be interested to understand your personal journey and how you personally arrived at this view and why you became committed to spreading this idea to as many people as possible. Yeah, so um, I grew up in England and my default worldview, I guess the one that I was given that the people around me had and the one my parents had, is probably best described as a sort of fairly boring Anglican version of Christianity. And it wasn't particularly important to our family. It wasn't particularly central to what we did. You know, we'd go to church a few times a year, maybe. But it was just, you know, the water we swam in, it was what I assumed was true and also provide an ethical guidance for the way we should live our lives. And I guess a classical thing as a teenager, I started to dig into these topics a little bit more. I've always had an amateur interest in philosophy. And I started to read about both the Christian religion, but also many of the other religions and different worldviews too. And quite quickly came to a realisation that one, just frankly, the evidence didn't stack up for these stories I was being told. It seemed much more likely these were, you know, the deities were the products of human imagination rather than the humans being creations of a deity. So the evidence and reason story just didn't stack up. There were inconsistencies within the Bible itself. And then you looked at different versions of religions that disagreed with each other. None of them seemed to have any evidential basis beyond the testimony of people who are long since dead, who grew up in ages where, you know, human knowledge was way more basic than it is now. So I didn't find the evidence and reason convincing at all. But I was also spotting some of the ethical challenges that flow through many religious worldviews. So there's there's much to like there, right? There's the golden rule and there's universal compassion, maybe even love. There's a sense of valuing others as you value yourself. So there's much to like, but there were also some real danger signs for me. And those in practical terms came through how hierarchies were seem to be built in many of these religions. You know, there's normally God at the top, there's the priests come next, maybe angels in between. And then there's a sort of a super class of privileged humans that get full consideration and then other groups of humans much less so. So I was asking questions about why women couldn't be priests, for example, um, and there are many examples along those lines. So I could see some religious worldviews leading into a sort of outgroup exclusionary ethics, even within the human species. You know, so caste is another classic example within some religions where some types of human, purely based on the family they were born into, were treated in a despicable way. So there were ethical issues too in many of the religious worldviews to go along with the good I saw. But even beyond that, the core idea that you would posit that there was a deity that was the ultimate expression of the perfect moral good, and that that being would have created a place where countless billions of innocents would be tortured for eternity, seemed to me to just destroy the ethical pretense of the entire enterprise. The idea that a perfectly good being could needlessly cause to suffer countless billions of beings forever clashed viscerally and directly, and it still does, with what you and I were talking about earlier on, about this intrinsic badness of suffering and therefore the intrinsic moral badness of needlessly causing others to suffer. But that essentially led me to become an atheist. And atheism isn't necessarily that interesting because it's just not believing in one particular thing, but there's an infinity of things for which there's no good evidence that we might choose not to believe. And that just happens to be a socially resonant one. So atheism isn't that interesting. And it particularly doesn't say much about ethics beyond the fact that you shouldn't use a supernatural grounding for your ethics. So that search then led me to, again, in my teenage years, led me to humanism. And I really liked the idea of humanism, secular humanism, because it kept this very naturalistic way of understanding the world that I'd come to adopt, you know, a scientific way of understanding the world with humility, using evidence, engaging honestly with reality and saying that we don't need a supernatural belief system or a deity to tell us what's right and wrong. We as humans because of the way we've evolved and because of who we are and because of what we feel and because of our rationality, can just decide to be good people, right, regardless, living in this natural world. So I liked it, the fact it had a natural grounding, but I also liked the fact it then took this stance of universal compassion for all humans, regardless of our sex, age, gender, how we look, caste, you know, anything else. It said it doesn't matter, all humans matter. But over time, I guess I came to see a challenge in humanism, and it's an obvious one, which is it's quite anthropocentric. You know, the word human is in the name. And although humanism is more about humans as agents defining our own morality, it doesn't say you should only care about humans, but it is very centred on humans. 
And even today, most of the humanist organizations, when you read their materials and their programs and their definitions, it's extremely human centric. And occasionally here or there, you will see a mention of, oh, and by the way, we should also care about non-human sentient beings as well. And that's shifting over time. But it is generally very anthropocentric. And in parallel, partly prompted by my sister who went vegetarian earlier than me, I had this other thread of thought in my head about non-human animals and their experiences and their suffering mattering. And over time, those two things sort of bubbled up together as independent strains of thought. And eventually, and actually around the time I went vegan a few years ago, I started to think, well, humanism has this problem of anthropocentrism. The existing animal advocacy and vegan and various other movements don't really take a stance on epistemology at all. You know, there are many people within those movements who care richly about non-human animals who do have a naturalistic way of understanding the world. And many of them had turned away from a religious way of thinking explicitly because many religions were pretty brutal about the way humans were given dominion over animals, particularly the more Western-oriented religions. So there, was, there were a lot of people with a epist- you know, naturalistic epistemology in those movements, but there were also many people with a very varied, you know, supernatural, religious, conspiratorial, conspirituality mindset in those spaces as well. And I really thought there was enormous value in bringing these two things together. So you had a commitment to a naturalistic epistemology and a sentiocentric compassion. And it didn't seem like anything existed to name that space and to define it and to maybe build a bit of movement around it. So that was my motivation ultimately for co-opting this um, word sentientism that had been coined in the 1970s and never really escaped from academia and saying, well, this is pretty much there, right? It's already somewhat naturalistic. It already has this sentiocentric compassion. If we can make it ethically pluralistic so that we can welcome thinkers in, regardless of whether they take a care ethics approach or a relational approach or a deontological approach, a utilitarian approach, right? Because the scope is what matters. The most important thing is getting all the sentient beings inside our scope first, and then we can fight over the rest. So if we can make that pluralistic, and if we can double down on this epistemological commitment, so it's not just about ethical questions, it's about every domain of human knowledge that we should apply evidence and reason and use that as an epistemological commitment, then maybe sentientism could fill that gap in the middle. And you you talked about, you know, why do I think it's important? I'm never quite sure how to address this because in a sense, it's such a basic intervention, you know, trying to upgrade humans' worldviews that there are so many more impactful direct things you could do in the world, whether it's about human ethics or animal ethics or even sentient AI ethics or other campaigns. But at the same time, because it is so basic, I also think it maybe is quite foundational because in a sense, when I think about all of the problems on the planet, particularly the human-caused ones, it seems to me that they're all traceable back to either a failure of compassion, you know, we just don't care, we don't care about some group of humans or some group of non-human animals or some group of other sentient beings, so that's a failure of compassion and ethics, or it's a failure of epistemology, where we've just got something wrong, right? So someone might believe that vaccines are more dangerous than the virus they're trying to cure, or they might believe that crystal healing will save me so I don't need to go to my chemotherapy appointment, or that a deity has privileged me and the people around me such that I can needlessly harm others for some reason. So there's there's so many different reasons. And I guess the climate change example is a, is a classic of both, right? Because there's some people who don't take climate change seriously enough because they don't care enough. And there are other people who don't take climate change seriously enough because they've been convinced it's a hoax, right? Or it's a conspiracy. So all of the problems that facing the world seem to either come down to a failure of compassion or a failure of epistemology and understanding. So it seems to me deeply important that if we can work to upgrade human epistemology and human ethics, at least to this baseline, this simple baseline of evidence, reason and compassion for all sentient beings, that the ripple through effects on every decision taken by any one of those individual people hopefully will help us address all of the world's problems. And we might also you know, need to persuade powerful AI to be sentientists too, because otherwise we might be in trouble. If we align powerful AI to learn from current default human ethics about how to treat sentient beings that are weaker than you, then we are in a whole world of trouble. Whereas if we persuade powerful AI or align powerful AI to become sentientists, they might still care about humans even once they've taken over. (laughs) Yeah, it does seem like rather than aligning AI with our present values, we should really be developing it to have better values than us. Absolutely, right? We need to choose our alignment target carefully. And, uh, you know, one hope, 
comes from the fact that I'm hoping that artificial intelligences will be less comfortable with cognitive dissonance, will be less comfortable with ethical inconsistency, and will be less subject to harmful social norms that tell us it's normal to needlessly harm and kill, kill others. But maybe that's just naive of me. Who, who knows? But I, it wouldn't surprise me at all if there is a potential future path where our future AI overlords turn out to be more ethical than us. It's not necessarily a high bar to, <laughs> high bar to be. Jamie, we're coming to the end of our time together today. Thank you for being so generous with your time. Before we do say goodbye, where should people go to learn more about sentientism and the work that you're doing to popularise it? Yeah, no, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you and to your audience. Thank you. I've loved the conversation. The easiest thing to do is just search for the word sentientism. And it's a bit of a mouthful, but if you take the word sentient, and just add ism on the end, you'll find it. So we have our own YouTube channel, much tinier than yours, and a podcast, which includes some presentations and talks about sentientism. But most of it is conversations with a fascinating range of philosophers and activists and sci-fi writers and CEOs and sociologists and psychologists. So I'd encourage people to delve into those if they want to dig deeper. We also have a website called sentientism.info, where people can sign up for our email mailing list. They can even add themselves to our wall and say, I'm a sentientist. If evidence, reason and compassion for all sentient beings resonates with you, you can add yourself to the list there. And we also have a range of online global communities that people can join. And they're open to absolutely anyone interested. You don't have to agree with sentientism at all. So we have some quite fiery debates in there. But those are almost everywhere you could want to go. Um, Reddit, Discord, the biggest is on Facebook. There's a Signal group. And we have social media on Blue Sky, Mastodon, Twitter, of course. I'm insisting on still calling it Twitter for now. So, um, yeah, if you just search for the word sentient with ism on the end, you will find us pretty much everywhere. And I'd love to continue the conversation. It's a really simple worldview and, a, uh, I guess, a, just a baseline, but it has some pretty radical implications. So even if you agree with it, there's still plenty to fight over. But I'd love to continue the conversation. Okay. Well, thank you again, Jamie. I will continue to follow your work with great interest and yeah, I hope we can do this again in the future. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure, Adrian. Thank you. Hello, Adrian here. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Waking Cosmos. If you would like to support the continued existence of the Waking Cosmos podcast and video series, please consider subscribing to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash wakingcosmos where you will also get early access to every episode. Alright, that is about it from me, I'm Adrian Nelson, until next time.